So I wouldn't go so far as to call this a presentation. It's more me standing up here and mouthing off a bit. But, um, my name is Matt Forbeck. I grew up uh, in Beloit, Wisconsin, just down the road here. I actually took classes at UROC when I was in high school uh, for computer programming, where uh, basically I got credit for stuff I already knew how to do because I had done computer science stuff in the summers at camps when I was a geek kid. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan, uh, graduated from there and started doing freelance game design. I worked for a company called Games Workshop out in Nottingham, England. They do uh, Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000, Blood Bowl, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, they have now become you know, best-selling uh, video games and things like that. Um, I used to work for a company up here in the road, down the road called TSR, which was the publisher of Dungeons and Dragons, which was founded in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, almost 50 years ago be 50 years in 2024, I guess. Uh, they were the first publishers of Dungeons and Dragons when it came out uh, then. And then it was sold in 1998, I think, to Wizards of the Coast, which was then subsequently purchased by Hasbro. So gaming has come from this little thing that was essentially adventure gaming, from this little thing in the sleepy town in Wisconsin to an international business that's got a big movie coming out. Uh, the Dungeons and Dragons movie star Christopher Pine is coming out later this month, I guess, actually, at the end of the month, March 30th or so. So, uh, And it's also spawned this massive movement that we have for video games and all sorts of different types of other games. We see games in every aspect of our lives nowadays. Things are uh, gamified, right? You, get, you earn points by doing things. You can uh, you know, get raffle entries by going online and doing things. They call this gamification because we're basically setting up uh, goals and ladders and achievements for people so that they can go and do things that marketers and such want them to do. But we also do games because games are really about play. Uh, we're there to uh, test things out, to try new things, to learn new things, and play happens to be one of those basic human things that we do that allows us to do those things. I've been making a living as a game designer for more years than I care to count. Uh, I started out, like I said, doing tabletop game design. I used to run a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group. We did Deadlands, Brave New World, a bunch of other role-playing games over the years. Savage Worlds is their big thing nowadays. Uh, I started doing, I, I worked for them. I was the president of the company for four years and then started doing full-time freelance again after that. At the moment, I've got something like 35 novels in print that I've written for different things, including a bunch of original stuff, but also a bunch of tie-in stuff. Yesterday, my latest novel came out, which is a novel for Minecraft Legends, which is the new Minecraft game that's coming out, I think, in April. Um, so it's, there's a you know, novel for 10-year-olds and up uh, coming out for that. Just hit stores yesterday. Uh, my big other thing I have going on right now is I'm the lead designer for the Marvel Comics tabletop role-playing game. So if you like playing Spider-Man or the Avengers, whatever, that kind of stuff, and you like doing games, you can start doing that again on the tabletop in August 2nd, which is when that game comes out. Um, in addition to that, I do video game design uh, and work. I, my last project that came out was, I had two come out last summer called Hard West 2, which was a weird Western uh, turn-based shooter. And then we also had, what was the Warhammer? We did one for Warhammer 40,000 from Snowprint Studios, Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus. And I wrote the uh, first player campaigns for that. I wrote a good chunk of Ghost Recon Wildlands. I was a story doctor in Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, I wrote all the dialogue for a game called Biomutants that came out a couple years ago on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One and uh, all sorts of other platforms. Uh, I'm currently working in that same studio doing a new video game that hasn't been announced yet. Uh, I also write comic books. I wrote about a dozen issues of the Magic the Gathering comic book and a bunch of other stuff over the years. So I've been at it for a while. Uh, this. You, the one thing that links all these things together, whether or not they're games or video games or novels or whatever, is that they're all linked by story. A lot of the games I work on are storytelling games, right? I do board games and card games and things like that as well, but a lot of those are uh, focused on telling stories with your friends or coming up with experiences your friends you can tell stories about. So for me, the difference between writing a role-playing game or writing a novel or writing a screenplay or a comic book isn't all that big a deal. It's really just a matter of format and audience and what your goals are. But the, uh, the basic things beneath all that, the foundation is about telling stories. So if you're the kind of person who likes to sit around a table, whether it's a bar or a dinner or whatever, and tell stories with people and listen to stories and absorb stories, then that's the kind of thing you can do too. The rest of that stuff you just learn to do. Those are crafts that you can learn how to do. Those are skills. 
that you can learn how to actually uh, bring to the, bring to the table. But uh, the core talent that you need to have is an enjoyment of stories. And if you like that kind of thing, then you can do all sorts of stuff with it. And like I said, I've been doing this for, oh geez, since 1989 full time now. So it's been a while. I don't even care to do the math anymore. 35 years, I guess. Uh, 34 years. There we go. And I started out when I was high school too, here down in Beloit. Um, and I love doing it. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, not a life for everybody. However, uh, my oldest son, Marty, uh, who graduated from UW-Madison a couple years ago, has now been following my footsteps. And he's my assistant writer on the Marvel tabletop game. And he's been doing some D&D stuff with me as well. Uh, and despite my protestations saying, Jesus Christ, don't you dare follow my footsteps, because uh, you should know better, right? Uh, he did anyway, and he's doing a great job. I was actually just editing a book that he wrote last night <clears throat> for, that hasn't been announced yet, but you'll be excited about when it comes out. Um, and he's you know, a fantastic writer. He does a great job. I just know that it's tough to make a living doing this stuff as a freelancer, uh, even if you're very good at it, and I've been very fortunate in my career. So when I see him coming up, I'm like, man, I've seen all the, the wake of the line of bodies strewn in my wake as I've come through this entire thing. All my friends who have washed out on this, because uh, especially in video games, if you're doing video games, the burnout rate tends to be about five years, right? You know, most people get into the industry last about five years before they say, man, you know, I should go off and do something that, you know, I can punch a clock and go home at night and not torture myself for and maybe get paid better. So, uh, but, you know, some of us managed to stick it out and do pretty well with it. And I've been very fortunate that way. It's brought me all around the world. I've been to Singapore and Shanghai working for Ubisoft. I've been to Sweden a num number of times working for different companies all across the country. Uh, just, you know, making games and telling stories. So I enjoy doing that. That's pretty much who I am. Uh, now, what I usually do at this point, because I'm lazy and haven't prepared for any of this, because I'm a writer. Uh, is I say, you know, I, what am I, I have a lot of skills in my life, but none of them are, involve mind reading. So what I'd rather do instead of trying to lecture you about things that you may or may not know about or may or may not care about is take questions from you so I can try to address things you actually do give a shit about. Uh, first uh, thought for you guys, which of these uh, many names of different games and, and novels and everything did you recognize? Raise your hand if you recognize anything that sounded familiar to you that you played. Oh, look at this. Almost everybody. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, which one stands out to you? Can we go around and... Uh, Nick, what, what's the one that stood out to you? Um, I think, did you say Blood Bowl? No, Blood Bowl, actually. Oh, okay. uh, Blood Bowl. You know, the fantasy football game from Games Workshop? I, I wrote four novels for it and five comic books, and I actually wrote one of the supplements for it back in 1991 or something like that. Before I'm sure any of you were born. Well, not yeah. right. Not the uh, the teachers yeah. in the room. Yes, exactly. Well, I played a lot of the big stuff. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I'm actually going to be a guest at a convention in two weeks. So you guys here local, uh, go to GaryCon, which is in two weeks in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and that's actually done on the anniversary of the death of Gary Gygax, who's one of the creators of Dungeons and Dragons. Gary uh, grew up in Lake Geneva, and that's where he was. He, came, he went to Chicago for a while, came back. That's where he lived when they published Dungeons and & Dragons, and, or TSR used to be. So it's pretty much a TSR family reunion. Uh, and uh, I went to Gary's funeral when he died. I happened to be in the area at the time, and uh, we all went over to the American Legion Hall, where the first convention I had ever gone to was. And we hung out and played games you know, to remember him. And his family had such a great time, they decided to put it on every year since. So right now we take over the, the Geneva Grand, the entire place. Uh, which is a pretty massive resort in Lake Geneva, and have a ball playing basically tabletop games all weekend. I don't know what, what uh, rang familiar to you. Uh, oh, did you? Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, that was a fun game. The interesting thing about Biomutant is one of the early decisions we made was to. Uh, to only have one voice in the whole game. So everybody else in the game goes, wah, 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 wah. you know, they make silly noises. And then there's a translator that translates everything for you, right? This little bug on your shoulder. And that meant that uh, the bug would always say, oh, he's saying this. Oh, he's saying that. And then, you know, trying to make that, say that hundreds of times without sounding repetitive was a challenge, but we figured it out. 
Um, but it was a fun game to work on. That was a game I worked on with guys that I had started out in the tabletop industry in Sweden uh, back in the early 90s. So, good crew. Very cool, yeah. Big D and D fan. I wrote a bunch of third edition stuff, and uh, I'm writing some fifth edition stuff. I actually have a fifth edition source book for a set of novels I did called Shotguns and Sorcery, uh, and we did a Kickstarter for that. I haven't actually released in the public yet. I'm waiting on my son to, one of my other sons, to do the virtual tabletop stuff for that. Once that goes to the Kickstarter backers, then we release the books to the public. So, yeah. good fun though. Wait. You're, 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 yeah, you never heard of Marvel Comics? Okay, you don't have to like them, but you may have heard of them. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It seems like it's been one of those things that was like a, a niche marginal thing, and now it's becoming more and more mainstream. And you, you notice that too? Oh, yeah. D&D &D over the years has you know, uh, waxed and waned. In the 80s, there was this thing called the Satanic Panic, uh, where uh, lots of mothers came out and said they had like, uh, was it Mothers Against Dungeons and Dragons, right? Or Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons. Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons. And it was a lady who basically said that these Games were teaching the kids satanic things. And the same people that told us that, you know, song lyrics played backwards are going to corrupt our children. Um, and so they're like, oh, we've got to scare all the parents. Got to have all these books banned and burned. And actually it increased sales of the books phenomenally, right? Uh, got them appearances on 60 Minutes, all sorts of crazy shit like that. Um, and then, you know, they've gone through a number of editions. Fifth edition came out about seven years ago. And it was doing pretty well. And then this thing called Actual Play took off. Right, which is basically a bunch of people sitting around a table playing Dungeons and Dragons with cameras on, right? And they would broadcast this on YouTube. The base, biggest and most successful example of this is a show called Critical Role. And these guys have actually signed, uh, it turns out they're all voice actors. They were really good at improv. So they're fantastic D&D players, right? The guy, Matt Mercer is a uh, friend of mine who's the head of the whole thing and he does a great job with it. Um, and these are really talented folks. They do voiceovers for cartoons, video games, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, and in fact, they ran a Kickstarter. I think they brought in like two or three million dollars to do a cartoon based on their actual play show that was then picked up by Amazon. So Amazon's doing two or three seasons of it too. So uh, fantastically phenomenal. Um, but that really increased the uh, visibility of the game tremendously over the years. And then there's a movie coming out, uh, you know, uh, at the That's end of the, the month. Movie? No, there were a couple other movies that were absolute stinkers that came out about 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, the first D&D &D movie was, there's a long story behind it, but uh, it was actually starred Jeremy Irons, believe it or not. You're like, oh my God, great actor, all this. And you're like, nah, man, he was chewing every bit of styrofoam scenery he could come across. It was just, uh, it's a legendarily bad movie. Right? Um, and, you know, I, I try not to slag anybody's creative efforts because, I, you know, I think, Anything that gets produced is kind of a miracle, right? It's just the fact that you have the will and you can manage to get everybody together on the same page to produce anything and get out the door and into the public. That's a stunning accomplishment. Whether or not it's a fantastic accomplishment is something different, but getting that achievement is amazing, right? Well, so. you never know. Sometimes a horrible movie becomes a classic. Yeah, exactly, right? So we'll see. I mean, I have high hopes for the new movie. It stars Christopher Pine and a whole bunch of other uh, neat and interesting actors. Uh, and... You know, Hasbro is fully behind it these days, so uh, I, I hope that it will do well. We'll see. The last one kind of came out because somebody had, their previous owners at TSR had sold the rights to this guy, and then, ha you know, Wizards came in, and then Hasbro bought the company, and they're kind of like, well, we don't want you to make that movie. The guy's like, I'm going to make it anyway. And, you know, God bless him, he did. It was kind of stunning they pulled it off. And he filmed the whole thing in the Czech Republic, I think. And that was Because uh, there's a lot of castles floating around the Czech Republic. But... Um, yeah, D&D &D is really kind of having this magical moment where it's uh, one of these things that's known by everybody, right? Um, the brand recognition is somewhere around 95%. Like any, you ask anybody in the street if they've heard of D&D, &D, and they'll say yes. It's gotten to the point, actually, where if you ask them about any tabletop role-playing game of any kind, you'll say, what's a tabletop role-playing game? People are like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But if you say Dungeons & Dragons, they know what that means, right? It's almost become the generic, 
for that. Although it's trademarked and you know, registered and all that, so the guys at Hasbro will fight that to the death. You know, we talk about in this class about uh, pop culture icons versus pop culture trends and fads, mm -hmm. and it seems like uh, staying power is a really big feature of being an icon. Yeah. No, I mean, that's something that's been going, again, start out here in Lake Geneva uh, 48 years ago, 40, 49 years ago, and it's just managed to catch fire. And basically, it started with a bunch of guys who were playing games in their basements, you know, guys in their 20s and uh, early 30s. I think Gary was one of the old ones. He was probably 33 or 35 at the time, right? Um, and these were people that started out playing um, tabletop war games, right? The kind of you would like move miniatures around on a table, like Napoleonic miniatures and such. And that was actually, in, uh, well, it wasn't invented. It was, you know, they actually did stuff like that back in Napoleonic days when they moved the, uh, they put up a big sand table, they moved the miniatures around to show they were, they were going to put their troops and such. But then the guy who actually wrote down one of the first set of rules for miniatures like that was H.G. Wells, right? The guy who wrote The Time Machine and all these other fantastic science fiction novels, War of the Worlds and such. But he was also a miniatures gamer, right? He'd get on the floor and he'd push his figures around and such. And, that tradition kind of continued for decades uh, until, you know, they started doing World War II stuff and they started doing fantasy stuff. And then it morphed into this thing where like, well, instead of pushing forward a force, let me just have my one guy here. That's my character. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to go into a dungeon. And actually a dungeon is really, a lot of people think that there are a lot of amazing things that happen with D&D, but I think one of the big innovations of it was that they put it in a dungeon because if you do a role-playing game you say you can do anything in the world here and people go man i don't that sounds like a lot right but if you put it in a dungeon it's essentially a flow chart right you're like i come to this junction i can go left or i can go right okay you go here you go over this door you know and if you're a game master or dungeon master doesn't know what they're doing he's just learning this stuff you're like all you have to do is read here it come it says go here read them this section figure out what they do they finish this they go on to this section you know? um, so in that sense, it, it, from a design point of view, it was really innovative in that way. Just to const the constraints are actually what made it more enjoyable than anything else. Yeah. Um, Steve McKenzie. Yeah, that's another reason D D is going very big is because of Stranger Things, right? Um, it's a, you know, been a big thing in Stranger Things. The funny part is that the reason it's in Stranger Things is because Stranger Things is based in the 80s, right? And there was this big movie that some of you have probably seen called E.T. by Steven Spielberg. It came out in the 80s. At Are the beginning... Sure you Whoa. Hey, wow, I'm actually oh, happy. Right yeah, there. that's kind of wild. So in E.T. at the beginning, you see these kids sitting around a table playing a game with a Dungeon Master screen in front of it. They never say D&D. &D. There's no branding on it because Spielberg actually contacted TSR and said, we'd like to have your game in the movie. And they said, well, that will cost you. And he said, well, we'll just take all the branding off, and then we'll just do it anyway, right? And that would have been a huge advertisement for D&D, &D, but they, were, uh, they never managed to negotiate that deal out. But now it, it, the whole Stranger Things thing is a callback to that, kind of, that scene, actually, in E.T., where these guys were playing D&D, &D, right? Uh, and that's another reason that D&D &D has gotten so big. In fact, they did a D&D &D Stranger Things starter set so if you wanted to play the D and D game they were playing in Stranger Things, you could actually buy the set and play through it yourself. And I think they're doing uh, D and D Stranger Things comics. They're doing Rick and Morty D and D. I mean, it's just everywhere nowadays. Yeah. Now, it could be hard to find things. That's one of the uh, things about TikTok. You know, there's the discoverability of stuff. YouTube has got like three or four seasons, maybe more of Critical Role right now, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Those guys actually do a pretty fantastic job. Nowadays, when they started out, it was just a bunch of friends sitting around a table. They didn't think it was going to go anywhere. But now they've got like massive amounts of scenery and, you know, dioramas and figures and fantastic glowing dice and costumes and all sorts of stuff. So. Um, in fact, I just agreed to be uh, uh, playing a celebrity D and D game at GaryCon uh, when that comes up. So they, this morning they're like, "Oh, we missed, we miscounted. We need somebody else." I'm like, "Okay, I'll join in and play some D and D. It's always fun." Yeah. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I'd love to hear. Yes. 
No, no. This I don't even know who the heck. There's a whole list of guests who are showing up at uh, Gary Con. I don't think the Critical Role guys are going to be there. I met them a few years ago at a show called Game Hole Con, which is up in Madison in the fall in October. Uh, but if you're local and you're looking to go to game conventions, that's another fantastic one. The guys there put on a really good show. It's up at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison in uh, October. They try to do it on a weekend that's not a UW football weekend. <laughs> right? So there's actually hotel rooms in the city. Uh, but they do an amazing job with that. But that's when I met all the Critical Role guys showed up. That was a few years ago, though. Nowadays, they're all multimillionaires and having a good time. So yeah, they, they tend to stay in, uh, uh, in L.A. I occasionally will bump into them uh, when I do Comic-Con down in uh, San Diego, right? Um, yeah, there's like, they have a lot of celebrity guys doing this stuff now. Like uh, Joe Man Manganiello is a guy who does tons of D&D &D stuff. Joe was Flash Thompson, the original uh, Spider-Man movies. He was in True Blood, been in all sorts of things. Um, what was he? I just saw him in a show just recently, too. He did a couple episodes or something as himself, right? Funny guy, but he's like this tall. And he comes to Gen Con, and he actually has his own clothing line of D&D &D stuff that he does called Death Saves, right? Um, yeah, but they're, you know, like he has a game that he plays at his house in, uh, in Hollywood that's just all tricked out, looks like a dungeon. And they have all these guys like uh, Vince Vaughn and Tom Morello show up and play D&D &D with him. Just funny as hell. But yeah, um, Matt, you've written a lot of books uh, on existing characters. Mm -hmm. Is that a challenge to create something new for a character that everyone expects to act a certain way, and then you like have to follow your audience's expectations? It can be a challenge to try to do license work in somebody else's world. Uh, you got two, there's a there's some strengths to it. And there's some weaknesses to it, right? The strength is that you have a built-in audience of people who already want to know. They want to see more about that character, right? So uh, probably the most prominent ones I wrote were, I wrote a, a three Halo novels for the video game, right? And two of them were based upon Halo 3 ODST and Halo 5. So you had uh, Buck, who's played by Nathan Fillion uh, in the video games. And, you know, he's a very strong voice. He's got a great banter. He's got this uh, very distinctive way of speaking in the game. And I basically had to have his voice rattle around in my head for about six months while I was writing these books, right? But fortunately, I like the way he talks, so it came out pretty well. But, um, so you have this built-in audience of people who are really excited to read these books. On the other hand, you have to live up to their expectations. Uh, for instance, in the first Halo book I wrote, New Blood, um, I killed off one of the characters from a video game. I get people giving me grief to this day about that. You killed the rookie! I'm like, well, you know, you had to kill somebody. The rookie, rookie had to go. So There's actually a long story behind that and why it was a good choice. But... and. I appreciate the fact that people are passionate about it because uh, one, that means I was playing with characters that they cared about, and two, hopefully I treated them with some respect as I shuffled them off stage and uh, did it in a way that engendered some emotion because that's the whole point behind doing stories like that, right? Um, so the, the trick of it, of course, is that it's not your characters. You don't own any of the stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, you have to hand it back to the company, and then somebody else might get to pick up the baton and run with it, right? Uh, with those characters, fortunately, guys at, uh, at Microsoft have been very kind to me and pretty much said, okay, when we're writing these characters, you get to write them, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, it could just as easily the next day be somebody else in charge and says, you know, I like mad stuff, but you know, uh, Christy over here, she's my friend and she does great stuff too. Let's let her write a book. So who knows? It seems like if they wanted to, they could bring Rookie back in the next book. Well, I killed him off pretty good. <laughs> Right. That's right. You can always do prequels. You can always do alternate timelines, retcons. There's all sorts of ways. I mean, I'm writing Marvel comic stuff right now for uh, the role-playing game. There's a good chunk of the chapter about what to do when a character dies. Because death is never permanent in comic books, right? They always come back somehow. And there's always another way. And, you know, even if you see the body and, you know, you, you ground it up into tiny pieces and burn the ashes and scatter them across a, uh, a pit of acid, you still never know the character could come back, right? You got a question? No, that's the video game. I was not involved in that. That's by the guys in France who do those. But, uh, I, but I, like I said, I wrote four novels for it and five video for five comic books. But that was a while ago. Actually, they got an omnibus come out. I guess two years ago. That's got all four novels and a short story, I think, in it. So, 
the question, how do I win this game? Ah. Cyanide, that's the name of the studio. Okay. Oh, I have a very thick skin when it comes to criticisms. Uh, number one is, as much as I'm trying to do a great job and I'm trying to uh, you know, please the audience and do all this, my number one person I need to please is the person who hired me, right? So they have to come up to me and say, I want you to do this job, and I have to make sure that I'm delivering to them what they ask me for. If, unless I'm running the company, I don't have that bigger picture where I can say, this is everything I need to know, and this is what I have to do, and you're wrong about this, right? I can give advice but the people were actually cutting the checks so the people get to make the decisions on that. So if somebody says that this wasn't up to my expectations, that's usually, in the case of Biomute, for instance, uh, a case of faulty marketing, right? They were, uh, people were led to believe it would be something else, whether that was on purpose or not. I don't think it was on purpose. But if they were led to believe it was something else or filled in the blank spots in their head thinking it was going to be something else and were not corrected on that, then when they come to actually play the game, they can be disappointed by things. Right. Uh, I often find it's better to under. This is the trouble with marketing. Marketing always wants to oversell the shit out of everything. Right. I find it's better to undersell the marketing, let people actually play the thing and then say, oh, my God, I have to tell you about this. Not enough people know about it, as opposed to everybody saying, yeah, I didn't really do what I was hoping it would do. Yeah. Um, better to under promise and over deliver, as they say. But again, I don't really have control over that. Now, uh, like sometimes when I'm having a bad day, I'll go to Amazon, I'll flip through my reviews, and I'll find my one-star reviews, and I'll get the biggest goddamn laughs out of that, right? <laughs> so the, the one-star reviews are things like, man, my book showed up damaged, one star. I'm like, yeah, I had a lot of control over that. Thank you. That's, um, you know, it's just, you can't please everybody, right? Uh, the, one, the reviews that bother me the most are the ones that are like three and a half stars, right? The ones where I'm like, oh, this person really wanted to like it but didn't for whatever reason. I could have had them, but I didn't quite get there. But the one-star reviews are just people who are angry about something, and I can't really do anything for them. Whatever it was, we missed each other by football fields, right? Um, and the same thing, though, on, on the five-star reviews, I'm like, well, I'm really glad you like this. I'm thrilled that you like this. But uh, if I'm looking for feedback, you know, I have to dig a little bit deeper into the five-star reviews. My mom will write me five-star reviews too, right? But I need to make sure that I'm getting something that will help me improve. So often I'll look at like the four or the three star reviews and see if there's anything in there that's interesting. Well, at a certain level. But on the other hand, you know, honestly, at the end of the day, I go home and see my wife and kids. And they're, how they feel about me is much more important than anybody else out there. Anybody on the internet who's shouting at me, I don't care. That's, that's their problem. They're having a bad day. They need to take it out on somebody. Uh, if I get to come home to my wife and kids and have a good night, play a game I like to play, see my friends, what do I care, right? Uh, when you're younger and you're more fragile about this stuff, you can be like, oh, no, I might never work again. Oh, no, people are going to hate me. I'm like, I've, got, I've been doing this long enough now. I don't have to look for work anymore. People literally email me. I had two work offers this week, right? I'm, it's not a problem. So... I don't worry about that kind of stuff too much. I try to do what in my mind I think is the best job I could do given the circumstances that I'm working in or whatever those happen to be. And to me, that's a point of personal pride. But it's got nothing to do with what people outside of me are going to say. Actually, I actually have one more point on that. I think the biggest thing you can do with this kind of work is not worry about whether or not the public loves it or not, or whether or not it becomes a success or not. The biggest thing you can learn to do with this kind of work, if you want to do it full-time, professionally, whatever, is learn to love the work itself, right? Like, for me, I like writing. I like, you know, typing. I like stringing the words together into sentences, rearranging them into paragraphs, putting those into plots, making, par you know, chapters, books, etc. I enjoy that process. So even if everybody hated the book and it didn't do well, I would still enjoy what I did. I still got that part of it out of it. So. I can, you know, the, as far as the other things, the trappings of success that come with that, those are, those are gravy. So, uh, and honestly, I mean, again, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm not one of the most famous people in the world, but I do okay, right? 
Uh, but I'm not Stephen King right? <laughs> or J.K. Rowling or whoever. I'm not, you know, multi-billionaire who's been doing this stuff. But that's not a business plan either. I mean, you can't make your business plan on hitting a lottery, right? Which is essentially what happens when you're, you know, those people have talent, right? Those people who have a very bigger talent. But there are a lot of talented people in the world, and very few of them actually become multimillionaires off this stuff. So you need to learn to enjoy what you're doing and not be so concerned about the rest of the stuff. A lot of my friends who would do this stuff that have washed out where people are like, I want to be the guy who's doing the signings. I want to be the guy who's, you know, uh, getting into the photographs and the interviews. I'm like, man, that's just, that's the stuff that detracts you from the work nowadays. I mean, honestly, I, I will turn down appearances to go do stuff because I'm like, well, that'll take a week in my life. And I'd rather see my wife and kids or be working on a book than go to this thing. So, Fortunately, I only live 20 minutes from here, so I can come up and you know, do yeah, this very, today. Very so, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I try not to get stuck, really. Um, I, writer's block, for instance, or designer's block, whatever you want to call it, it tends to be a psychological thing, right? Um, the main reason that people get writer's block is because they get to a point in the story where they don't know what's going to happen next. They've written this story, they've got these great scenes, these characters they care about, everything else, but they just don't know what's happening. They get, they're like, okay, well, I've written myself in a corner, what happens? Or, you know, sometimes they get bored with it. They're like, well, I got all this stuff, but it just doesn't seem to be gelling. And really what's happening is your subconscious is telling you you're doing something wrong, right? It's saying, yeah, you, you know better than this. You know that you're not doing this right. Uh, you need to stop and, and think this over. So my solution for that, and everybody's got a different one. Uh, in writing, they say there are uh, pantsers and plotters, right? So a pantser is somebody who sits down and writes the book off to see their pants, just you know, lets it flow out of their head. Stephen King is probably the most famous pantser in the world. He doesn't plot out his books. He doesn't outline them ahead of time. Doesn't do anything like that. He just sits down and goes, I got an idea. And boom. Okay. It's reams of paper flow out of his uh, typewriter and he's done. Yeah, I'm sure it's a lot harder than that. But, it's, but it seems like that from the outside. Plotters are people who sit down and figure out the outline ahead of time. Figure out what's going to happen. Uh, a friend of mine, Lee Goldberg, who does uh, uh, tons of best-selling novels. He writes with Janet Ivanovich and a bunch of other people. He's written a bunch for TV. He says, I never get writer's block, but I'll get plotter's block. Right? because I'll sit down and try to figure out what everybody's going to do and who the characters are, and sometimes I get stuck there. Well, if you could spend a couple of days figuring out your plot, your outline, uh, then the writing itself is actually pretty easy after that, right? Because you've already done the hard, you've made the hard decisions, right? Now, the trouble with that is a lot of people who are pantsers or, or fall through that direction. Um, they, th to them, having an outline sucks the fun out of writing. Right, because writing is an act of discovery as much as it is as much as reading is an act of discovery. When you're writing, you're like, how does the story unfold? I'm figuring that out as I go. And then I'm going to write it down. I'm going to polish it. I'm going to present it to somebody else. How does the story unfold? You don't know. Yeah, you know, even if you're a good outliner, you might have an idea. But you know, I have friends who write like a twenty thousand word outline for an eighty thousand word book, and yeah, it does suck the fun out of it, right? But my outlines for uh, you know three hundred, four hundred page book are usually like five or six pages, right? Because I'll write like three lines per chapter and save myself some room for divergences and then go. And if I get, you know, halfway through the book and say, oh yeah, but now I got this better idea because now I know the characters better. I know the plot better. I'm really feeling it. And that, that stuff I was doing before is just going to work, right? Now, if I'd spent, you know, a month and 20,000 words working that stuff out, I would feel, I would have anguish about throwing that away. Right, because it becomes precious to you because you put work into it. But if you've only spent a couple of days on it, you're like, ah, screw it, boom, throw it out, start over, rip it to pieces. And then I've done this before, especially when I was starting out. I would sit down and then you know tear up the outline and then re-outline again from where I found myself. What's the new plot going to be? Am I going to go back to where I wanted to, or am I going to go entirely perpendicular? Right. Uh, I think my first big fantasy novel I wrote for Dungeons and Dragons. I probably did that three times, maybe five times, where I just said, oh, I was actually, I was writing the book, and I got this great scene going on with uh, uh, the, the, these people kidnap this child, and the, this guy is chasing him to try to get his child back. And the big bad has got this scene where he's like facing off against a vampire. He's like, I'm going to take over this place. And the vampire comes in and just slaughters him and does such a great job. It's such a great scene. I'm like, yeah, I'm just digging this. And I looked up when I was done. I'm like, oh my God, I just killed off my bad guy. What do I do now? 
But I'm like, man, it was the right thing to do. It just felt right. My subconscious, whatever, told me this was the right thing to do. I'm like, well, okay, uh, he's got this henchman, this hireling, uh, this underling who's been working with him, and she's going to take over from this point. And then it turns out that the entire trilogy, by the end of it, was redemption arc for her, making up for the horrible things that she had done. And it really came together well. Your subconscious does a lot of this work without you even paying attention to it, right? It's your conscious mind when you're trying to sit down and make this stuff happen, fighting against that, that really causes the conflict that causes writer's block. To get back to your actual question. That is a very <laughs> unexpected answer. Uh, the funny part is to me that seems obvious it's now because I'm doing it. Because it's not like this is what I do, but like maybe this is a good thing. That you know, if I'm not able to do something, maybe that's because I shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. That's your mind telling you you're screwing it up. So, um, which is okay. Then you should listen to that, right? Throw it away if it's if it's it, you know, if it's no good, throw it away and do something else. Right? You can always come up with another story. People often think, you know, I also get this one where people say, I've got this book. How do I sell it? I'm like, well, you start sending it out to agents, start sending it to editors. You can find ones that will take unsolicited manuscripts. But while you're doing that, go write your next book. Don't stop, right? You're on a roll. Don't stop because, uh, honestly, most people don't sell their first book. A lot of times they sell their third or their fifth book or whatever. And then their editor looks at them and says, you got anything else? And you're like, ah, I got a whole trunk full of stuff here. I've been waiting to sell you. Um, but the trick is, every time you write a book, you tend to get better and better as you go, right? So you're first, it's like the first time you did a painting or a drawing or whatever, it sucked, right? First time you write a novel, it's probably going to suck. That's okay. Let it suck. Uh, the old saying is you write a million words before you're any good at anything, so you might as well start, get them out of the way, and move on to the good stuff, right? But a lot of people think, no, this is my best work I've ever done. And it probably is the best work you've ever done, but it won't be the best work you'll ever do, right? And even if it's the best work you've ever done, it might not be the stuff that's going to sell. So work on your next book. You could do two things simultaneously. Work on your next book while you're sending that one out. And then, uh, you know, if it sells, fantastic, right? Then you're already got a head start on your next one. If it doesn't sell, you got a head start on what you're doing the next time. So. But don't sit around and think it's just all going to magically happen. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, that sounds like fun. I mean, there's a lot going on there. You got a lot of the, the secret knowledge and, uh, you know, uh, you know, with the bits with the copycat and all that kind of stuff. But I see elements of games like Wingspan in there where you're trying to do the, you know, there's, it's a very common thing for Euro games where you have uh, things that you as an individual have as a goal or you as your team have as a goal, but the other team has a different goal. So you're not, you, you don't know what it is. So you're working against them and they're trying to figure out why are they doing that? Why are they stealing these things? So. I, also, I also have a play track for them. Oh, nice. I need it. That's great for a restaurant style game. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, that's a beautiful amount of work you've done there, too. Amazing. You look like you're having fun with it. If creates a game like this, it has so many details, it's so well thought out, uh, how, how do they market something like this? You know, is there... Oh, there, there's, well, there's, there's, that's a large question, right? Uh, there's two answers to that. Uh, well, the first question is, are you doing this for fun? Mike Gray was a buddy of mine. Mike was the director of Hasbro uh, Game Acquisition for many years. And the first thing he would say is, is this art or is this commerce, right? Are you doing this for money or are you doing this because you're, you know, trying to create a piece of art for yourself and your family and your friends? Art is one thing. You do whatever the hell you want, right? Uh, if it's commerce, then you got to think about how it's going to sell. So, and then if it's commerce, then you want to start thinking about, am I going to find a publisher or am I going to self-publish it, right? So the smart thing for somebody who's just starting out usually is to find a publisher because there's a lot of things you don't even know you don't know. Right, like how are games brought to market? Right, is uh, you know, are you going to try to sell through Target and Walmart? Can you pull that kind of stuff off? Probably not. Are you going to try to sell through traditional hobby games distribution, which is a three-tier system where you have the manufacturer, you, uh, or the publisher, a distributor, and the store, and each one of those takes a percentage of it. Um, so if you're the publisher, you're going to get forty percent of the retail price. The distributor will take ten percent. The store will take half. Right. Uh, so then when you're doing that kind of stuff, that's the reason you have to cost stuff out. I had, I had some people consult with me once at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair where they showed up and said, we got this great game. It's all about teaching kids about dinosaurs. We printed up a thousand of them. They're sitting in our garage and uh, they cost us $40 each to make. We sell them for 50 bucks. I'm like, that's great, but you can't sell them in stores then, right? Uh, because if $50 is what you think you're going to be able to make off that, the most you can pay for that is $20. I mean, probably the most you should be paying for is $10 in cost because you need to leave some room for profit for yourself. 
Because the only way you're going to make a profit then is if you sell every copy of that game and make no mistakes, which never happens, right? So, um, like I said, there's a lot of stuff you don't know about, like where you're going to source your components, what size of box you, is going to fit best on the shelf, because there are standard sizes of boxes, what the best printers are, do you want to print in China, or do you want to print in the U.S.? Can you print in the U.S. for a lot of this stuff? A lot of the manufacturers move so far overseas nowadays, we have lost the ability to do a lot of different types of components in this country, right? Even in this hemisphere. So, um, so if you're willing to learn and put a lot of time in it, you can do it yourself. It's not impossible. If you're trying to do a role-playing game, which is essentially a book, very easy to self-publish, right? Because uh, there's things like drive through RPG, there's print-on-demand, there's PDF delivery. Very simple to do. Try and do a game with a boatload of components like this, it becomes more co complicated. Right? Uh, not impossible, but you're probably better off finding a publisher who knows how to bring these stuff to market, actually knows what the market looks like, and maybe uh, can do a, uh, has a better handle on what people are looking for than you might. Right? But it gets tricky that way. Then you have to basically go around to conventions or to wherever and pitch that game to publishers. Right? You have to make appointments, say, hey, uh, Ray Weir's over Calliope. I want to talk to you about this game I got. Uh, you know, the guys over at Asmodee, I want to talk to one of your 16 different game publishing departments and figure out which one of these is the best fit for this. Uh, They're looking for games. Generally speaking, a lot of them are looking for games, uh, especially for board games and card games and stuff like that, because the tradition there is not to do them internally. If they're licensed games, we'll often do them internally, right? They'll, they'll match up, say, uh, Dungeons and Dragons with Clue or whatever, right? And they'll have somebody who's working for Hasbro do the conversion and make it all fit. The guys at Mattel, actually, the game design department, uh, it used to be one of their assignments every year, they had to do at least two versions of Uno that were licensed, right? So whether it was Dora the Explorer or Battlestar Galactica or whatever, you had to do two versions of Uno that were slightly different and, you know, hopefully sold to a different market. So, um, But for outside stuff, for new stuff, often they're looking for submissions from people. So most places will have submission guidelines on their website. You can go there and they'll, you know, they'll say, submit here or how to submit or how to contact. And you, Go look it up, and there'll be uh, instructions, maybe a PDF you download. You follow the instructions to the letter. They will have something in there that will uh, probably scare you to death. It's called a, a liability waiver, right? Uh, essentially, you need to sign something that says, if we look at this game and do something exactly like this, you will not sue us. And most people say, but you're trying to steal my game. And yeah, technically they could. It almost never happens. The reason is it's much simpler for them to just buy your game than it is to steal it. But the reason they, otherwise they can't look at it because if they look at something that you're doing, the problem is we all swim in the same cultural soup. We're all doing the same things. We're all watching the same movies, reading the same books, playing the same games. It's very common to have people come up with similar ideas. Right? It's called parallel development. It happens all the time. Um, and so if you show them a game that's about stone soup and they're like, Man, I love Stone Soup. I was just reading this book about Stone Soup, and we've got three versions of Stone Soup coming out right you know, We're already working on it. And you're going to say, yeah, right. right. But they're going to be, no, no, honest to God. you know. Um, so if they look at your game and don't have you sign a waiver, then you might feel like they cheated you and sued them. Right? So they want to have you sign a waiver before they can look at anything. Uh, for instance, I did a game called, uh, we did this game called Deadlands, which is a weird Western game, hor Western horror game. Right? Set in like 1876 uh, at Pinnacle, and it was our biggest seller, our debut game. And we're like, ah, oh, who the, nobody's doing westerns, period. Nobody's doing westerns, much less nobody had ever done horror westerns for games at that point. And we were six months in development when a company called White Wolf announced that they were coming out with Werewolf the Wild West, which was a Wild West version of their best selling werewolf game that they had done. And we're like, God, mm. and there's no way that it, they, they didn't know, we didn't know. Uh, and we beat them to market by three months. Otherwise, we would have looked like a copycat. Uh, the year I came out, with, in 1999, I came out with a copy, uh, dystopian superhero game called Brave New World. One of the reasons we did it is we're like, yeah, nobody's done any superhero games for a while. We should do some superhero games. I love comic books, right? Ah, we'll do this. There's a big hole in the market. There were six or eight different comic book games that came out that year, right? Because, again, it's you know, everybody's doing the same things, watching the same stuff. We all have the same idea at the same time. Exactly, right? It's really rare to find that one thing that nobody has done and everybody has missed, right? It's pretty common to find stuff that 
expect, you know, when they say you're one in a million now on a planet of, you know, six billion people, that's still a lot of people. Gotcha. So it's, a, it's a, what they call it, asymmetrical. There you yeah. go. There you go. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah. A lot of fun stuff you can do with that. Uh, the Trail at House in the Hill is one of the few games my family and I play constantly, right? We, we, uh, we've tried a bunch of what they call legacy games. Legacy games are games where you can string together a whole bunch of them. You change the board as you go along. There's stickers. You tear things up. There's new boxes you open up when you get to certain points. Um, and we've kind of bounced off like Pandemic Legacy, Legacy Inside, and a bunch of other ones. But Betra uh, Betrayal at House in the Hill, Betrayal Legacy, we played all the way through. Um, and I know the designers, too. They're fantastic folks. They do a lot of great stuff with that. Um, and they just came out with third edition. They've done a Scooby-Doo edition, too, if you like, you know, for younger kids and such. It's kind of fun. So. Well, I know I have the, the D&D one, the Betrayal Yep, that's a good one, too. Uh, now, those, that's a, for those who don't know the series, the whole the neat idea is that you're trying to investigate this area, and at some point, some, you run into a big, bad monster of the week kind of character, and one of you becomes the traitor. And you don't know who it is, right? Could be anybody. So you're all working to like toughen yourself up, make yourself ready for the big bad, and then one of you turns, you're like, oh, this guy who we've been giving all this stuff to is now trying to kill us all. And, you know, and you're like, well, I guess I'm trying to kill all my friends now. <laughs> so it's good fun. It's a nice little twist. Yeah, exactly. It took me like 30 different times to figure it out. Yeah. Now, the, the, one of the reasons that uh, uh, ran, we use randomness in games, randomness is a big factor in games, whether it's dice or cards or spinning wheels or whatever else, uh, it helps because it means the game is, uh, is, it can often be different every time you play, which is great. But also one of the main reasons you use is protects the ego of the players, right? It means that uh, somebody who's not very good at the game Still has a shot against somebody who's played the game well. Somebody who's skilled at the game, knows the game well, will probably beat a newbie most of the time, but not all of the time. A newbie still has a good chance to get in there and do something. And if you have two players of equal skill playing each other, and one of them wins, they can say, I win, I did that, I beat that guy, I did, I, it's all down to me. And the guy who lost could say, ah, it's just bad luck this time, you know? And, you know, because it's not your fault you lost, it was just the dice or the cards or whatever. Or against so one it. of the things we are discussing are the values of the game, the promoting and the society that we live in, and what you're describing right now is the difference between like understanding of meritocracy versus good fortune and good luck. Yeah. Uh, how is that? I guess it sounds like it's an important part of games. It, games are. Uh, we often talk about trying to balance games, right? Uh, game balance is kind of this amorphous thing that everybody thinks they know what it means, and very few people actually do, right? Uh, so we say, okay, the game is balanced or it's broken. And what we really mean is, it, it, most people mean, is that there's not an apparent strategy I can use every time that will always win this game. And there's no other reason to make any other choices in a game. A game, uh, I think it was Eric Lang or maybe it was Mike Sandler, a good buddy of mine said, uh, a game is a series of interesting choices. That's really what it boils down to, right? And if, if you can always make the same choices every time, then it ceases to become any fun. For instance, if you play tic-tac-toe, if you've ever played tic-tac-toe and sat down and, and worked it out, it doesn't take you long to figure out the strategy behind tic-tac-toe. I mean, there's only two moves you can make as an opening move, and they're either going to lead you to a win or a draw. There's, if you know how to play tic-tac-toe, there's no way to lose the game, right? And once you hammer that out, it becomes dull. It's no fun anymore. There are no interesting choices to be made. Then it's just a matter of rotely going through it all. So, um, so when it comes down to game balance, you know, we're trying to find something where there's a number of different choices that appear to be equally entertaining or engaging or different strategies, but none of them are dominating each other. And the interesting thing we could do with this, if we're doing like collectible games where you have like Magic the Gathering or Pokemon or whatever, right? Uh, and we do multiple releases for these things. We can put out a set of cards and once the cards are out there, we could say, well, that broke. Uh, suddenly the blue cards are the most pow powerful and popular cards or Charizard is kicking everybody's butt today. You know, what are we going to do? Well, the next set that comes out is going to have cards that kick the ass of blue or Charizard, right? And hopefully try to balance that out again. So we have this negative reinforcement going on where we find the holes, the imbalances in the game, and then we patch them. And of course, when we patch them, that's going to create new holes in the game in a different way. And when you're playtesting a game that's that complex, there's no way to figure out every permutation. Maybe AI will be able to help us out with this kind of stuff in the future. But there's literally no way to figure it out. So the only way you can actually play test these things is on the market. And when the market tells you this is broken, 
then you figure it. Video games were kind of interesting because we actually can get the metrics from people directly without having to have people yell us on the internet that was broken. So we could say, everybody's playing this. We know that's the most popular thing right now. If we don't want everybody to do that and have no choices, then we need to fix that. We need to introduce new factors, new factions that will be more popular, or at least counter those, so that other ones have a chance to breathe. And what if that's how God feels? Yeah, maybe, <laughs> right. Well, you take a lot of player feedback, right? Uh, there are a couple different ways. One is that when you get a, a game that's at that level of success, you usually have a full-time staff of maybe you know, five different designers, maybe 30 people working in a game, maybe more, depending on what you're doing. You have art directors doing stuff. You have artists you're hiring and usually freelance. But you usually have a core design staff who's dedicated to doing this kind of stuff, right? So part of what they'll do is you can assign certain people to do analysis and figure out what's going on, why it's being played like this. You can take feedback online from forums, from contact forums, from tournaments, from organized play, and see what kind of decks are being built. And then you can try to see where the holes are. When I used to do collectible card game design, and I did a few of them, I would use a database to figure out, you know, uh, this is how everything works. This is, sometimes you design it in Excel, which is a pain in the ass. I used to use a thing called FileMaker Pro, uh, which also works. There's a new system called, what the hell is it called? There's an online thing called Component Studio, component.studio. Uh, that's run by some guys in Madison, actually, that do the Game Crafter. Uh, if you guys are looking to do prototypes of your games, by the way, there's a print-on-demand game design company called the Game Crafter up in Madison uh, that ships worldwide, whatever else. But they do a fantastic job with it. They have all sorts of things like if you need meeples or cards or uh, game boards or covers or whatever. And they're not great for, uh, for producing a game for selling, but as far as producing a game you want to bring to class or if you want to do play, uh, prototypes for playtesting, they're fantastic for that, right? Uh, and Component Studio's got a setup where you can actually go through and there's a database where you can populate things and keep track of everything that's going on. I used to like to go through and say, okay, we've got all these different cards and what are we missing? Where are we all, do we have too many plus ones or plus threes or are we not have enough blacks in this or whatever, right? For different colors of cards and mana. So you can do that kind of analysis from a, a eagle eye point of view, from you know, a mile up, right? But then you got to get into the, in the uh, trenches and basically play the hell out of the game too. There's only so many times you can play a game like that before you have to go to press though. And the problem is that your own personal biases will get in the way. You'll start playing a game a certain way. You need to have people who are willing to play it and just throw out their personal style and just play it in any old goddamn way, right? You also have to have people who are willing to take it and say, how do I break this, right? And uh, that's actually one of the things I look for in play testers. I find people who will be willing to just try crazy stuff to break a game. And uh, often, if I find people are breaking one of my games regularly, I will ask them to be one of my play testers. Right? <laughs> so if there's somebody in the public who's breaking a game, we'll say, you know what, I'd rather have you break the game before I go to press than after I go to press. So can I send you the stuff ahead of time for you to take a look at and bang on, right? And most people are happy to do that. Often you don't even have to pay them. Uh, they're doing it because it's fun. They'll get a credit, they'll get a copy of the game. Uh, you'll get feedback before you go to press. Uh, like, you know, a lot of designers are like, oh, no, I don't want to hear about from anybody. It's so much better to have people destroy your game before you put it out in the public, right? Um, once you've been doing it long enough, I mean, the problem is if you're playing a game with somebody who's your friend and they're telling you how much your game sucks, it's hard not to take it personally sometimes, right? But if you're a professional, you start thinking, what you realize, especially after it's like your fifth or tenth game or whatever, that game is not you. It's an idea that you have. You're trying to see if you can make the idea good, right? And ideas are a dime a dozen. Everybody's like, I got the greatest idea for something. I'm like, man, I can't tell you how many times people say, I got an idea for a novel. I got an idea for a game. I got an idea for this. I'll give you the idea, you create it, and then we'll split the profits. I'm like, mm, man. For one, I got more ideas than I could possibly do anything with. And for two, the idea is the easy part. You know, people who have ideas who do this stuff for a living have more ideas before breakfast than people who don't do it have in their life, right? It's not a challenge to come up with the idea. The trick is actually turning that idea, and you learn this as soon as you try. The trick is taking that, that beautiful platonic idea in your head and turning it into something concrete, whether it's a book or a game on a table or whatever. That's the real challenge. And pulling that off is the hard part, right? So you know, work on that skill more than anything else. If you can find people and help you with that, and you can take feedback from them because you're just, again, you're looking at the execution of your idea, that'll be okay. I'm often my harshest critic, right? 
I've, I've done, I did a Marvel Heroes battle dice game. It was a little collectible miniatures game. These dice that were hollow and they had springs in them. You could squeeze them and they popped open. You'd stick the figure in them. Well, and they sold them in Walmart, Toys R Us, Target. We had TV commercials. And man, uh, the first few times I played that game, it just broke terribly. All right? It was just awful. Uh, in fact, what I'll usually do is I'll sit down, come up with the idea, try to write out the rules, decide it sucks, try it again, try it again, try it again. Finally, I get something I think is workable. I'll make a prototype, I'll build it, and then I will play by myself by going around playing every position on the table and then realize it sucks again and I need to fix it. And then I'll bring in a close friend whose judgment I trust and play with them, and they'll tell me how it sucks and I'll fix it. And then we just keep expanding until we get older, bigger and bigger groups of people. Eventually get to uh, what I call cold play testing, which is where you send it out to people you're not in the room with. And you say, can you decipher these rules and see whether or not this makes any sense? Play it without me leaning over your shoulder teaching it to you, right? Some companies will do stuff where they do like the traditional product testing where you're like behind a one-way glass and you watch them as they do it. Most companies don't do that because it's really expensive to pull off. Like only Hasbro and, Mil and uh, Mattel really have the resources to pull that kind of stuff off. So you really just got to get in there and bang the hell out of the game until it's something you can be proud of. Yeah. Now, everybody tinkers with the D&D &D rules at some point, right? Um, this is one of the things when I'm doing role-playing game design, like I'm doing with the Marvel game right now, I try to tell people you can't make everybody happy. And the whole point is to tailor it to whoever you're playing with, to you and the, the taste of you and your playing group, right? Um, no, nobody plays it the same way unless you're playing in a tournament or you're playing on television or whatever else. So uh, eventually they'll say, yeah, I like that, but this would be better. And you'll come up with a new rule and you'll just play it that way. And if you really come up with a bunch of rules, you might think publishing them, right? Which people do for uh, the DMs Guild or drive Through RPG or things like that. You know? um, but it sounds like you're having fun. Oh, yeah. Now, especially if you're doing a D&D &D campaign or a role-playing game campaign of any kind, don't get too precious about your, plot, your plans because the players will destroy them, right? Uh, and no plan survives contact with the players, right? It's... it's uh, when I'm, I'm writing adventures for the Marvel game right now, and half of it is what to do when things go wrong, right? When something unexpected happens. I had this adventure I wrote for Shotguns and Sorcery, for, uh, and then we did it for Cypher System in 5th edition. And I've probably run it 40 times, and probably 25 different ways have been played, right? Because the players are coming in and they're like, we're going to try this. And, you know, and you know, I actually encourage that. I'm, like, I'm just setting up a scenario here for you. Literally, what they call it scenario writing, right? And then... We're going to see what the hell you guys do. And I, I'm not going to try to lead you by the nose or tell you what. I have some ideas, right? I can tell you, know, if, you're, if you're not sure, I can suggest a few things. But it's really up to you to come up with strategy or how you ever want to play this out. And that's actually the fun of role-playing games, is watching people come up with that and then own those ideas and try to execute them in the game and watch them just you know, uh, go badly, because they always do. An, an idea should go badly. If it, does, if it goes very well, then it's just kind of boring. It's like, oh, that worked. No, you want to you want people to have troubles and struggle. That's where the fun comes in. Well, I feel like this idea went remarkably well, other than I wish we had more time. Oh, well, and, thank you again uh, so for having me. Please give you. a hand oh. to Matt. Thank you so much. Good questions, good games. That was fantastic, Paige. You did a great That's job. Very impressive. And if you have questions, maybe Matt can stick around for a couple more minutes. Sure. Uh, but the class is done, so thank you very much, guys. Stay ahead of the snow. Yeah, if you guys have questions later, you can reach me online, too. I'm at matt at forbeck.com, F-O-R-B-E-C-K. Uh, I'm also on Twitter and Facebook and Insta and all the other silly things. Yeah. Happy to help you out if you have questions at any point. I had a lot of people help me out when I started out, so I'm always happy to pay back the favor.